this is a key thing that you want to remember, okay? Whenever someone moves a pawn forward, it means they've created weaknesses somewhere on the board. So when I see this pawn moving forward, the weakness that jumps out at me is this d6 square, okay? And I'm envisioning my knight landing there, and that's going to cause some big problems for the black king. When your king is in the center of the board, and there is an open file where a rook can attack you, you have to be really, really careful. That's very, very dangerous. And so rook to e1 looks like the move that I'm going to play. I could trade first and then go with a check, but I think I'm going to do it first and just line up to create that discovered attack. Notice how when I'm coming up with the move that I'm going to play, I'm asking myself, what are the biggest weaknesses in my opponent's position? Well, they're behind in development and their king is stuck in the center and my rook is lined up on it. So with that in mind, what's the best move? Well, it's probably something to do with that. I think it might be knight g5 just to attack that bishop that's pinned and the king is right there. This is how I cause problems for, for my opponent. If you are attacking someone's king that's in the center of the board and they're trying to castle to safety, top priority is usually going to be not letting that happen. Don't let them castle and get the king to safety. So how can I prevent that? Well, if I take here, they take me and I take with the bishop. That stops them from castling. So that looks pretty good. If I take with the bishop first and then my knight jumps in, it also stops them from castling. You can't castle through a check. I'm also hitting the queen. I'm also hitting the pawn. That's a fork. That looks very good. So black has a problem. You've got two weaknesses. You can't really defend both of them. Obviously, yeah, you have to save the queen. And now I think I will jump in and take the pawn. Now, the important thing here, another key point, is I'm not just taking a pawn. What I'm actually doing is forcing the king to move, which means they cannot castle for the rest of the game. That is much more valuable than just taking a pawn. I mean, yeah, a pawn is cool, but I, don't, I need more than a pawn. I need the king to not be able to castle. That is very, very valuable. Yeah, here's a key point again. I think I am going to go with knight to e6 check. Here's why. Because when I force the king back, it's in between the rooks. They're disconnected. They're not defending each other. They don't have very many options of where they can move to, right? And so that's always a good thing to do if you can. So that's why I think that's important. Here's a key point. When you have a piece like this that's deep in enemy territory, rather than trading it off, if you can just support it and then replace it with another piece, that's usually going to be better than you know, just giving it up for quickly. Okay. So yeah, we are going to do this. Could also take with the pawn, which is not uh, totally crazy either, but I know I like having the rook come up here. I like having the rook come up. So whenever someone plays C, this is very important that you understand this. Whenever someone plays C5, they are gaining a lot of space. And if you allow them to have that space for the rest of the game, you're going to be in trouble. Okay. But what is the drawback to this move? They are not developing a single piece. They've only made pawn moves. I have a piece ready to go, which means you want to probably try to open up the center quickly, sooner rather than later, to best take advantage of the situation. So usually there's, there's two moves that you have to play against C5, either E5 right away, or you could try B6 to attack it this way. And then on B4, you could play A5 and you just undermine it that way. When you're trying to figure out what to do, try to find your worst piece and how do you make it better? What's my worst piece? Well, maybe the knight, maybe the bishop. So if I go bishop a6 and trade for this guy, is that a good trade? I think so. I think it is. So let's develop a piece and uh, maybe trade off one of our bad bishops or make it a good bishop, right? Okay, there you go. I'm going to take with my knight and now that knight is also developed. Okay, now it's on the edge of the board, but it's, it's somewhere, right? It's better than nothing. When you're trying to think of a plan, if you have a section of the board with a mass of pawns, a lot of times pushing those pawns is a good strategy. So where do I have a mass of pawns? Well, right here, look at this, these pawns. So my bishop's in the way. I think I wanna move the bishop, play c5, c4, c3, just use these extra pawns for my advantage. This is another key point, okay? When you're pushing your pawns down the board, if you can keep them side by side, that's amazing. Okay, because they always have the option of like either one can move forward. They cover a lot of squares in a nice straight line. Like it's just super powerful. If you can accomplish multiple things at the same time, you should do it. So queen b6 gets my queen off the back. So now this rook can come into the party. Supports the pawn so that I'm ready to meet this with a pawn push. And the only thing that you might say is like, well, what about knight to c3? But then I was going to have a, a tactic pushing the pawn, forking these guys and it was gonna be bad news, okay? So white's trying a different approach of trying to blockade them, which 
probably makes sense. Rooks should go behind past pawns. Now, right now I only have one past pawn, which is this guy. Past pawns are pawns that can become a queen with no other pawns capturing them. So this guy could. This one's not a past pawn because of this guy. This one's not a past pawn because of this guy. But rooks going behind past pawns is usually very, very valuable. Now, if they would have taken me, I take towards the center. This is a key point. Whenever you recapture, general rule is you want to take towards the center. It unleashes my rook. And now I'm the one who's going to start pushing pawns. This square and this square can be targets. Okay, this is a key point. They can be targets for forks. I remember the f the very first chess tournament I ever played in. I was playing black in a game like this, and I think I played a move like knight c6. And then knight to b5 happened, and I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And you don't have a, a clear way to deal with that, right? You're just going to get forked, and it's just not a good position. So make sure you don't let that happen. So easy solution, simple thing. When you see this bishop lined up here and the knight comes out, just play c6 and you just shut down any ideas of the knight coming in there. That's a simple and easy thing to do. Key point here, I'm not actually threatening to take the knight because of the pin. Notice this, these rook pins on the, the A and H files. We're seeing a lot of that in these last couple games, right? This is an important tactic to, to be aware of because it comes up in a lot of situations, okay? And white understands that and they realize that I'm not actually threatening anything. But I did save my pawn by moving it, so that's why I did it as well. Here's another key point. Sometimes in these situations, you have to make a quick decision, especially in these games that you can kind of tell are gonna be complicated. There's gonna be a critical moment later. I don't wanna use all my time right now trying to figure out the perfect plan. I just need to make a decision, play something, and then you know you use that time later at the critical moments. And that's something that I've actually struggled with myself uh, sometimes where I, I try to think too much too early I don't give myself enough time for the critical moments later. If you look at white's queen, it doesn't have a ton of options. It's kind of trapping itself almost. If I could take away the age file and this and this and this, do you know what that means? That means the queen is trapped. So it rook h8. Another bonus of bringing my queen back, which I didn't really think about before, but it helps support my rook. So it's important to always be scanning for those tactics because they, they just pop up at the most random times, right? Like here we are, we're trying to defend our king and then all of a sudden, oh, there's a queen trap, you know? Like you, you never know. And the moment that you relax is the moment that they happen. Listen carefully. When somebody attacks you with their queen early in the game, you want to harass the queen as much as you can with your pieces. Unfortunately, knight of three doesn't work. So we change it up and we play d4. But this is a good developing move for us, right? Because our bishop's going to come out. If you have like two moves that you could play, they're both good moves, but one of them maybe might could potentially change, for example, like a bishop. And the other one you, you guarantee you know you're going to play, like Castling King said, I'm going to play every single time. Play that one first. See what your opponent does. Maybe you get some more information. And then when you move the bishop, you can put it on the like absolute best square. When you're going to launch a pawn storm on the opponent's king, if there are pieces there that you can hit with your pawns, for example, a3, b4, b5 at the knight, it's going to be a much faster attack because each pawn push is like attacking something. They have to move, they have to move, they have to move, right? So as soon as I see the queen over here, I'm like, yeah, that seems like a pretty good plan now, right? Let's attack over there. So I'm going to go a3, try to play b4, b5, kick the knight, you know, to attack the king. If there's no pieces at all, it's going to take me like a bunch of pawn moves to even get to where I could attack anything. You guys understand how that works? This is something that you want to remember is usually you don't want to block your e-pawn when your bishop's not developed because you need to move the bishop to get the, you need to move the pawn to get the bishop out right and you can't do that if it's being blocked this is really important one of the most important reasons for getting your bishops out is so that you can get your rooks to the center of the board okay like this bishop is stopping this rook from going to the center so moving it out is important for that reason. So what I've done on this side of the board is I've moved the bishop out, I've castled, I've got my rook to the center, now I'm bringing it back. It's not a big deal. It's not blocking any rook in the corner from, from coming to the center. So that's totally fine for me to bring my bishop back there, okay? That would be very different if my rook was still over here. Then I wouldn't want to play a move like this. I would much rather just trade the bishop or something. Normally you would take towards the center. That's the general principle. But in situations like this where I'm trying to develop quickly, especially in these aggressive E4, E5 openings, I actually like to make an exception to that rule 
and take with the D pawn for two reasons. Number one, it immediately opens up my queen and puts pressure on the center, which is nice. And number two, and probably more importantly, the bishop is now immediately let out because otherwise I have to spend a move moving my pawn forward before I can develop the bishop, right? But in this case, it's just ready to go. I don't have to waste any time. And that's really nice. And actually, I think I am going to take advantage of that and immediately go bishop g5 and pin this guy. When you're looking at a position like this, you want to ask yourself, okay, what's the biggest strength in my position? What's the biggest weakness in my opponent's position? Well, it's the king right here. If I can get my queen over here, this is checkmate, right? So queen d3 is basically saying, look, if you move your knight somewhere, the game is over. So you can't take here. I would just take you. And then again, checkmate. You can't go there because the pawn. If you play d5, I just take it. If you play f5, I just on passant. Actually, you can't play f5. What am I even saying? There's a check. So I don't see how black is going to actually save their knight. So let me just play queen d3. And you can see how dangerous it is when you have a rook on an open file on a king like this and there's no knight to defend. It's, it's extremely dangerous. And I think we're going to see a quick checkmate here in a few moves. Normally, if they take this pawn, the bishop gets trapped. You play b6. But there's also this other bishop which might come in, and that's a different story. Then my king would have to leave. No, the bishop's probably still going to get trapped eventually because my rook would slide over. So I don't think I'm worried about that. I think we're just fine. So what am I going to do? I think we just put the pressure on the bishop here. Let's go knight e5, attacking this, threatening to win a pawn. But it is important that you at least think through what's going to happen here, and you are aware of the little trick of uh, trapping the bishop like that. When you have double isolated, when your opponent has double isolated pawns, the square right in front of them is a nice target. Why? Because there's not going to be any pawn on either side that can chase you away right? It, there's no squares like that on this side of the board because the pawns are just nice and pretty. Anywhere that I move could always be chased around by a pawn. But when you have isolated pawns like this, there are these squares here and here that are easy targets for me. So that's why I played bishop e6 because I want my knight and my bishop to be able to go there and, and I don't have to worry about the pawns. I, ne I almost never will use a rook to babysit a pawn like this. Almost never. Like, if there's any other plan that I can think of, I'm going to go for it. But in this particular situation, my, the obvious plan would be to go for this pawn. But then the rook comes in, and then the rook takes this, and it's like, this rook is just going to take all my pawns. And I have these past pawns to worry about. Yes, I have this guy, and maybe I can make something happen, but I just didn't want to let that happen. So I made the exception of, like, all right, we're going to babysit the pawn. The other thing that's really important here is I could see that this was only going to be temporary. And the reason I could see that is because this guy is a weakness. And I'm going to go here next move and take it. So if white, for example, just tried to leave the rook sit here to keep my rook stuck, I'm just going to go here and guess what? I'm going to take your pawn. And if you try to like ever defend that at any point, guess what? Now this is freed up and I can do something like a5 or a6. And if you on passant, I take and I've freed up my rook. Okay, this is really important. What I see some sometimes beginners will do is somebody attacks a pawn, they have a lot of other options, but they just go for the, the, the defending, and then their rook ends up sitting there for the rest of the game defending a pawn, and that's terrible. Okay, that's not what you want. So I hope that un, I hope you understand why I played it in this case, why that was an exception to the rule. There was just wasn't really anything else I could do, and I needed to stop the rook from coming in on the seventh rank. When you are playing in an opening like this, like the fried liver attack that's been accepted and it's total chaos, you need to spend more time than six or seconds or two seconds on a move like my opponent is doing. So this is not a good use of their time. It's just not. Uh, there's no way you can calculate all this stuff without spending a little bit of time. And I think they're going to blunder if they keep playing this fast. Like It's just not a good strategy. I hope you guys enjoyed this and learned a thing or two. I'll see you next time. As always, stay sharp, play smart, take care.